these people that we've written off as, as frauds and quacks are launching national first aid campaigns, national public health information campaigns supported by the government and using the church as a means to spread this information, which brings us to the role of the church. Now, the church is often in these school textbooks accused of being anti-medical. Some even say that the church banned their staff from being surgeons. And it includes this interesting quote, the church abhors the shedding of blood. A fascinating quote, but one that only really seems to appear in school textbooks. There's no evidence of it in primary sources. And something that we should think about, if the church abhors the shedding of blood and bans surgery, why are there so many crusader church-based organisations dedicated to surgery? I'm always worried that so few of my, my pupils question this. Uh, this. It's, there are many orders that are distinctly medical. What there is a ban on is non-medical staff in the church from getting involved in surgery. There is that in the historical record. The church is very clear that if their staff are not trained for surgery, then they shouldn't do surgery. But that's not quite the same as saying that all church staff are banned from surgery. Now, the vicar at our local church, Sam, a lovely woman, a lovely woman who I respect in immensely, and if I have a spiritual problem, I will go to her. However, I don't want her to commit, to commit surgery on me. She's not trained for it. I'm not convinced that that's necessarily her field of expertise. I'm glad the church decided to ban her from surgery. And so these hospitals, most of the hospitals are run by the church in this time period, but most of them really are, are just hotels for pilgrims. Obviously, obviously, hospital, hospitality, it all comes from the same Latin root. Uh, but many of the hospitals would offer cures for the sick. Now, some of these hospitals, yes, had crazy ideas. Uh, John Murfield of St. Bartholomew's Hospital, London, which is still, of course, running, said, if you want to know if a patient will live, take the name of the patient, the name of the messenger who summoned you, the name of the day the messenger arrived. Join the letters together. Turn it into a number. If the number is even, the patient will live. If odd, the patient will die. Very random. And yet, there were some medieval medical hospitals, as we understand it, set up in the 1100s. There were 25 proper medical hospitals by 1200, and 50 by 1300. The Order of St. John, the St. John's Ambulance, had 13 in England, and the Knights of St. Lazarus had 13 leprosia with a headquarters in Burton St. Lazar. Now, all wards had trained medical staff from 1300, some even earlier. Westminster had trained staff in, in 1100, but they weren't necessarily university educated. And their wards tend to have 14 to 16 beds. From the 1250s onwards, cannabis was used as a painkiller, especially for some reason in southern Scotland. Southern Scotland seems to have absorbed most of the country's cannabis production for medical use. But these Knights of St. Lazarus, written off as frauds and quacks, well, they knew that leprosy was a, a terrible disease and that it was infectious. And so they, they rounded up lepers from around England and made them live in these leprosia. Under, under quarantine. Now, we must remember that one year in four in medieval England, they didn't grow enough food to feed everybody. So in one year in every four, there is famine. So did they kill the, the lepers? No. These medical staff cared for them, even in times of famine, feeding them when they couldn't feed themselves. And we write these people off as quacks and frauds, but they were crusader knights who had declared a crusade a holy war against leprosy. They said that the real work of God was to take the fight to disease and to cure the sick. And these people deserve our respect and our admiration for many of the, the crusader knights of the Knights of St. Lazarus got sick of leprosy while caring for their patients. They stopped them, they gave food that could have gone to themselves, to their patients. They got sick caring for their patients, all for the greater glory of God. And what a noble cause was theirs, the medieval crusader doctor. They certainly deserve to be better remembered than we currently do.
Now in these hospitals they have male and female surgeons. The Templar hospitals had separate rooms for noisy, smelly or disruptive patients. <coughs> the Hospitaller hospitals had separate wards for different illnesses. And what were these medieval hospitals like? Well, thanks to the ideas of John of Ardern, they were pretty clean. Floors were swept regularly and washed every day. The plaster walls were redecorated every year. Now, every uh, every Christmas, I'm in the NUH uh, pantom uh, Hospital Pantomime, so I, I know that the Nottingham Hospital quite well. I've been in that pantomime for about 10 years. I cannot remember them replastering that wall in a decade. That would not have been allowed in a medieval hospital. They'd have said that standards had slipped too low and they'd be closed down until they cleaned the place thoroughly. So plaster walls to be redone every year. Sheets for the patients to be washed twice a week. Women had their hair washed every week. Men had their beards trimmed every week. And no, those of you who know me know that my, my wife works as a, a dietitian for the hospital. So if I don't mention the dietetics department, I'm a dead man. But they, these medieval hospitals also had their own dietetic departments. And let's listen to what the medieval patient gets while being treated at one of these medical hospitals. Mutton to be served every week. Patients to be given a gallon of ale a day. A gallon of ale? You'd never get me out of that hospital. Give me that a day. But also they're to be given cheese, lentils, unshelled beans, eels or salt fish. So yes, when we think of medieval medicine, they have some crazy ideas. The theory of the four humours. People going around trying to count the letters of messengers to see if people will live or die. Doctors talking about elves making people sick. But we should also remember that they were obsessed with cleanliness for their patients. That they could cure their patients of many of the illnesses that afflicted them. Which is why their patients paid out of their own money to come and see them again and again. That they were hard-working, dedicated individuals, many of whom gave their lives for their patients. That many of them had an excellent bedside manner. And that, yes, they didn't know as much as we do today. We are blessed. Of course, the modern NHS is far better than the medieval doctor or the medieval surgeon. But that does not mean that we should look down upon these medieval medical practitioners. We only know today what we know because of the pioneering work of the medieval doctors and the surgeons. And that next time you see a program talking about these quacks and these frauds, you should remember the works of John of Ardern. You should remember the works of female doctors like Ascende in medieval France. You should remember people like Gilbert Zangacus and Roger Frugard, men and women who worked hard to try and give us the medical knowledge that we have today. Thank you and stay safe.